On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1990. We're going to be taking a look at the Highwaymen, and they're going to be performing Highwayman. <laughs> Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So this performance is just under three minutes in length. It is a short song, so we're going to watch it the whole way through. And if you guys want to watch it over and over again, as always, there's going to be a link in the description below so you can click on that. But without further ado, let's get the guys up on screen and see how they get on. I'm just going to edit this into the video because unfortunately this has been blocked worldwide. So I've done a re-edit and taken out all of the audio. So click on that link in the description below to watch the performance that I watched and then analyzed and then come back here for the analysis and I'll see you guys in the comment section and there we have it what a great live version of the song that was what I do love about this performance is not only the way that the band are just totally on it it is a huge band but the great thing about the way that they're playing is they're just putting in what is needed they're not all going for it we've got probably between five and seven guitars on stage it's something crazy like that but everyone's doing their job independently and not just strumming out rhythm we've got one guitar that's just muted strings just getting everything to move along from that rhythm perspective but then we've got another guitar really tasty lead lines coming in for the call and response and this is where the live version varies from the recording or the recorded version that's on the record because the guitar is really low in the mix on the original whereas here we get to really appreciate the amount of technical ability on show just getting these notes really nice and clean and concise but also the melodic side of the lead lines they're so cool there's a little ascending run that we go through a few times that is so hooky and it's such a great ascending lead line that it really stands on its own and you sometimes lose that because you can't hear it on the record whereas here as i said it's higher in the mix so it's great to hear all of these extra lead lines that you might not necessarily appreciate on that record. Just to mention that this is a Jimmy Webb composition and he originally released it in 1977 on his album called El Mirage and Glenn Campbell released a version of the song as well in 1979 and that was on his album called Highwayman and it wasn't until 1985 that these guys released their version of the song on their album also called Highwayman but the Highwaymen were called that because of this song and the four guys really saw themselves as outlaws of country music as I've mentioned on this channel many times previously about outlaw country and I think I have a video on each of these guys independently on the channel if you want to check those out. But they released their version in 1985. The song was actually shown to Waylon Jennings a few years earlier, but Waylon didn't really see it working having heard the Glenn Campbell version. But when these four got together, Marty Stewart was another guy who said, you guys have got to do this song because it's perfect for you. And when you think about the nature of the song being about reincarnation and the fact that we've got four separate voices within the song and voices of the subject of the song going through those reincarnations it really does make perfect sense for these guys to record it and release it which they did on their album and that album went multi-platinum and like i said that was called highwayman but it was a number one song as well and it was their only number one hit so it had a massive impact on the country charts when it was released and it also won a grammy for jimmy webb and this was for best country song and that was of the year of 1986 but when you analyze the song get into that lyrical content it's just the perfect match to even have the ability to put four separate vocalists on a song of this nature 
and maybe with just that one vocal it wouldn't quite have the same effect and it's possibly why this was such a huge hit for these four guys and I love the way that it's in that conversational space. Interestingly, for a country song, we start off in B minor. So it's set in that minor key, which gives it a little bit more of a somber sound rather than the major keys that pretty much country music sticks to, where you've got that opposite effect of the lyrical content sometimes being a little bit more somber but then the happy sound of those major chords and major chord progressions in the background but here it is just a little bit darker on that side to begin with but then we do get into a lot of major chords after that but you can pretty much hear that we've got our B minor notes being played from the lead guitar that's going to give that call and response throughout the whole song. So I just want to go over a little bit of the lead parts that we have where we've got the classic call and response of the blues, but it's really interesting the way that we're higher in the mix. So we get to hear these lines really clearly, listen out for that lead guitar, filling the gap between the vocals, just giving you that focal point to just tide you over before the vocal then comes in again. and it's so subtle, the way that we've got this again in B minor. Really simple lines, but tastefully played, great control, vibrato, fantastic tone that we've got in this performance. And I'll just let it play a little bit further on so we can hear the next line that comes in. And it's that. Again, really basic line, but it does so much. And this is the classic example of less being more, rather than going and trying to fit in too many notes. You've just got a nice slide up of three frets. That's all that's happening here, seven to 10, back down to seven in your minor pentatonic shape one, if you want to get there in B minor, which will start in your seventh fret with the first finger. But really subtle in terms of the application, but that's exactly what this composition and performance needs. Let's just listen on a little bit further. I haven't worked out all of the lines, so we'll just busk it and see what's going on. Uh. And it's that kind of thing right at the end of that line. We've got this little hammer on, pull off, and then going back. And right at the end there, again, subtlety is the key. That's going to be the buzzword for this performance. In terms of the lead guitar, keeping that pull off right at the end so subtle rather than and overdoing it. Obviously you don't want to do that. Dynamically it doesn't fit in. You want everything to sit behind the vocal and have this relaxed attitude as the vocals really put that across being in that baritone space in terms of the range that we've got going on here vocally. Because it's low down there in the baritone range it means that we've got that conversational space that we're filling. So that's why it sounds relaxed, because it's very much just the telling of the story and the lyrical content of the song. But let's listen on a little bit further. And there we have that run up that happens multiple times and it's really melodic. So we've got, and it looks like, and sliding down. Kind of like that. I'm going to take it back a little. Yeah, those are the notes. We've got that. I haven't looked at exactly where it's being played. It sounds like there's a little bit of sliding going on, especially at the end. But keeping it relevant to our pentatonic shape one on the seventh fret, we have to break out of that pentatonic for one fret on that first phrase, and the second phrase actually, but we're on the sixth fret, then we get back into our shape with a pull off from nine to seven on the D string, like that, and then we go 
and sliding down off that pull off. Just down one fret now. Back into our minor pentatonic shape. And it sounds like there might be a slide at this point. Kind of like that. It's really subtle, but you do hear that slide in there at the end, that rather than just hearing it straight like that, or it's kind of hear a little slide into it. It might not be as exaggerated as that, but you can definitely hear some movement going on with the playing and the movement on the fretboard as he gets up to that final phrase. But we'll have a little listen on. Oh, and then just resolving it right at the end, so that little slide up, kind of like that. And now you can see how we've changed instruments and the way that when we've got this break in between the vocals, we've now changed to a flute sound and it's very much to do with uh, the sailor, I'm sure, changing over that instrument. And it's still following that same principle of filling the gap in between the vocals and not playing over the top of the vocals or behind the vocals because you still want the focal point to be on that instrument and the vocal and the instrument is like having another lead voice. Any instrument that comes in between a vocal and then another vocal phrase, you have something to listen to in between, which just keeps your interest. If you're splitting up vocals with nothing, just like rhythm guitar, then it doesn't add as much interest as it does when you put a little lead instrument in there. And I love the fact that because of the subject of the song has changed in this second verse, we get a different instrument to go with that reincarnation of that person as now they're living as a sailor and they started out as a highwayman and going all the way through then a construction worker I believe and then finally an astronaut or a spaceship captain something like that so those are the four lives that this person's going through throughout the song. So it's great to hear that change in instrument. And again, it's a case of the lead guitar coming in just when it's required and then taking a back seat while other instrumentalists come in. And when we're looking at the rhythm work going on with the guitars, you'll see how, I mean, I've got obviously my lead tone going on here, so it's probably not as applicable to playing rhythm, but you'll see the way that we've just got a little bit of Johnny Cash, for example, just playing, just doing downstrokes, holding the strings, muting them to make sure that he's not getting anything ringing out. And you can probably hear the delay on the sound as well. If I hit the strings and then stop, you'll hear it repeated, but the guys playing rhythm don't have that. That's just on the lead guitar. So it means that by hitting those strings, is keeping that rhythm moving forward and just adding a percussive element to the live performance rather than just wasting having an instrument. You can see the way that Johnny's just playing along and I think Chris is playing some chords so his guitar might be in the mix there but like I said lots of guitars in this performance. I'll have a go at just playing the chords along with the song so you guys can see where the changes are and I'll apply a little bit of palm mute so that my guitar won't be too loud over the original track. At this point, we then go through all of the chords that I've just played, but same order. I'm applying that palm mute. Might not want to do that, but with the palm mute, it means that 
You can get more of a gallop approach to that rhythm, and it might be the fact that there is a guitar that's doing that just to move things along a little bit. It's just all about the song here. This is the point that when Jimmy wrote this, he said that he had a dream where he was, I think, riding a horse or trying to escape from like the police or somebody <laughs> who was chasing him. And he woke up and I think it was after a night of professional drinking. That's what I read earlier. But he had a very vivid dream. He got up and he just started writing this song. And he said that after a couple of hours, he already had that first verse and the first verse is just repeated effectively four times so he already had the whole song pretty much he just needed that lyrical content for the other verses but it's all about the story here and just great execution live with the band just holding back and just popping in with the instruments here and there exactly when they're required and dynamically that just allows the song to breathe and there's so much headroom in this performance it means that you can hear everything really clearly and it's really well mixed as well. You can tell that this is a professional job and it's just a great live version of the song. But thank you guys for suggesting this video for me to take a look at. Keep their suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock.